you have your Bible or your Bible app, uh, turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, we're going to be in, uh, starting verse 41. Mark 12, 40, verse 41. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, and, um, and I don't mean like you just left it at home, but if you don't have a Bible, there's actually Bibles in the pew rack in front of you, and we would love for you to have that uh, as a gift from, from FBC Allen. Um, the Word of God is, is extremely important to us. And we want to make sure that we get the Word of God in, into everyone's hands. And so if you, if you need one, feel free to take one. We are uh, about to finish up a series we have this week and next week. You see it across there. Uh, it's a nine-week journey that we've been on together. As we, it's called This Is Us. And what we're doing is we're talking about things that make us us. Think, uh, this, this is who we are and what is important to us as a church and, and who we are and what should be important to us as followers of Jesus. And this morning... Our focus uh, for us this morning is going to be what it means to have a generous life. Now, I, I know what may be going through some of your minds is like, oh, no, here we go, sermon on money. Um, or maybe this is your, you're a first-time visitor, or this is your first time to come back to church in a long time. Or maybe you've never even been to church, but you probably might be saying, I knew it. This is what I thought church was going to be about, and they're going to talk about money. And guess what? You guys are talking about money. Or maybe, maybe the last time you were in church. Because I recognize there's all kinds of different people in here. Maybe the last time you were in church, somebody said something about money and it made you mad and you're back and here we go again. But I want to tell you something. Before you, before you walk out <laughs> or before you tune me out, I want you to know that this really isn't a talk, a sermon about money. This is a talk about life. And this is about the life that God has called all of us to live. And God has called us, he's called us to be generous with, and I have some, some things for here, you know, it's just some props. He's called us to be generous with our what? Time, right? He's called us to be generous with our time. He's called us to be generous with our talent. You guys are good readers. Thank a school teacher for that or a mom or dad. You need to be generous with your what? Treasure. Time, talent, and treasure. But there's one, there's one other T that we, we often forget, and I want to remind you of that one today. It's this one. Just so you know, the T is silent in this one. Okay. What does that say? Comfort. Yeah. Yeah, we get the time, talent, treasure. Those are, those are big ones, but we also don't want to forget about comfort. You see, God is not just concerned about your money, which is a lot, what a lot of people think, that God just, he's just concerned about money. But what he's concerned about is he's concerned about all of you, your whole life. God wants us to be generous with, with all of it. Now, I want to take a look at an example from Scripture of a generous life. And before we read this, I, I kind of want to set the scene up for you. Jesus is in the temple, and um, he's, he's in what was known as the court of women. And, and there, was, there was the court of the Gentiles, which was the outer court of the temple. And it was the court of the Gentiles where anyone could go. Anyone could pass through, could go into uh, Jew or Gentile. Then there was the uh, court of women. And then uh, and after, after that court of the Gentiles, no Gentiles were able to move forward. Matter of fact, there was inscriptions on the temple wall that would say, you know, this is basically punishable by death if a Gentile goes into this next court. So there was the, the, the court of the Gentiles, the court of women, the court of the Israelites, the court of the priests, and then, of course, the, the Holy of Holies, uh, the, the actual Holy of Holies temple structure that only the, the, the high priest went in once a year. Now, it was called the court of women, not because that there were only women there, but because that's, that's as far as women could go. They weren't allowed to go beyond uh, that court. And it was in this area where there were 13 chests. Uh, some people said they, they looked like trumpets because they were, they were kind of big at the opening, and, and then they kind of closed down. But uh, the, there were 13 chests that people brought offerings uh, and sacrifices to place in these chests. And they were, there were 13 of them because there were 13 different offerings. Some were offering for, for sin or sacrifice offerings. Uh, some were, were offerings for the temple. There was, there was 13, 13 different offerings. And so Jesus is in this court, and, and, and uh, you read, uh, scholars say that Jesus kind of taught in different courts throughout the temple. I mean, he taught in the court of the Gentiles. He did a lot of teaching in the court of women. He did a lot of teaching in the court uh, of the priests and the Israelites. But he's, he's watching this, so this isn't, this isn't weird that Jesus is there. But he's in the court, and he's watching the people bringing their offerings. And this is kind of the setting of it for what we're about to read. And this is Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 41 to the end of the chapter. It says, Sitting across from the temple treasury, and this is where he's at, he's in the, he's in the uh, court there, he watched how the crowd dropped money into the treasury. 
Many rich people were putting in large sums. And then a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little. Summoning his disciples, he said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. For they all gave out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now, sometimes uh, when I read things in, in the Bible, I wonder why, that, why that's there. Or sometimes, why, you know, what's, what's the reason? And to me, this story doesn't seem like a really huge deal, this, this particular uh, event. It doesn't seem like a huge deal. And of all things that Jesus taught about, the things that, that he preached about, the things that he said, miracles that he did, why, why, was this, why was this mentioned? In fact, when this actually occurred, this probably, this probably went unnoticed by everyone. Nobody, nobody saw it. Uh, who was in the court of the women, probably. But Jesus noticed it. He saw it. And it caught his attention. And it was important enough that he brought his disciples over to watch with him. He wanted them to see this because he was going to say something about it. And what he noticed was not the offering, per se, but the action in the heart behind the offering. And it was so important to him that he ascribed greater value to the widow's gift than he did to all the others. And so, so one of the reasons, I think, at least for me, that this is in here, that this is in Scripture, is really to take away any excuse that I, I would have to live generously. I mean, this widow had every excuse. She was poor, and uh, to, be, to, <laughs> to be described as poor in Scripture, it's, it's you, are, you have nothing. And not only was she poor, but she was a woman, which, again, women in, in, in Jesus' time weren't ascribed much value. Now, Jesus did, and, and he taught he, his teachings. Um, he taught the importance of women and women and, and, and what women can do in ministry that they're involved with, and he showed value to women, and he, he, he went to women that most people would, would avoid. So she was poor. She was a woman. But not only that, she was a poor widow. And so honestly, in Jesus' day, there really, there really was no other type of widow. She's probably having to live off the charity of, of people that she knows or, or charity off of neighbors or strangers. She lives in a society that values wealth and that values family. And as a poor widow, she has neither. She has nothing, and what she has, she's giving away. And I read this, and I think to myself, here's the question that comes at me from the Scripture is, so J Jimmy, what's your excuse What's your excuse? Seriously, what, what, what is our excuse? Because I'm guilty of it, and, and maybe you are too. We're guilty of giving God every reason why we can't be generous with our time. Why we can't be generous with the talents, the gifts that God has given us. Why we can't be, why we can't be generous with our money, with the treasure, and why we don't want to get up out of our comfort zone. What does she have that I don't have? What's in her heart that's not in mine? And I looked up the definition of generous, and, and here's what I found. Showing a readiness to give more of something, like, for example, money or time, to give more of something than is strictly necessary or expected. You see, no one expected her to give everything that she had. No one would have said that it was necessary for her to give it all, and yet there she is. She's living out the very meaning of generosity. So how can we live a generous life? And I, I believe that we can see from Scripture at least, at least four things that are going to characterize a generous life. And this is in your bulletin, in your outline, if you'd like to take notes. I'm going to give you four things really quickly. The first one is this. A generous life is characterized by humility. It's characterized by humility. Now, here's a, here's a four-letter word that's going to get a lot of us into trouble. And this is a, a word that keeps us from being generous. I'm going to write this one down, too, because I know you like to... Read things. Okay. This is one that'll get us. What does that say? Mine. Yeah. Mine. Makes me think of, uh, I don't know if you ever saw Finding Nemo, but you see those seagulls. And what, what do those seagulls say all the time? Mine, 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 mine. That's all they say. And, uh, you know, that, that may not be what's in our hearts. I mean, I'm sorry, we, that may not be what we're saying out loud, but that, that probably could be something... That is in our hearts. And if you want to kill generosity, if you want to kill a generous life, just let that word mine take root in your heart. Let its roots go deep into your life, and you'll kill any kind of generosity, or you'll kill out a generous life. But here's the problem with that word mine. You ready for this? 
it's not true. When you say mine, that's a lie. Romans 11.36 says, Everything, everything comes from the Lord. All things, again, just to be clear, all things were made because of him and will return to him. Praise the Lord forever. Amen. Everything, all things. 1 Chronicles 29, 14, and 16. It says, But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? For everything, there's that word again, everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your own hand. So what we're giving you, God, is going back to you. Lord, our God, all this wealth that we've provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand. Just in case you missed the point, he says it one more time. Everything belongs to you. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's not ours. It belongs to God. The time that you have, the time that you have, it's a gift from God. The talents and abilities that you have, they were given to you by God. The treasure that you have, the money, the finances that you have, whether you think you have a lot or you think you have a little, it's God's. Your comfort, that's a blessing from God. It's, it's God. It's all, all God's. Everything belongs to him. The poor widow, she knew that. She knew that in her head. But more importantly, she believed it. It was, it was in her heart. It had transferred from her brain to her heart, and it lived out in her life. Giving all that she had, though I'm sure it was not easy for her, was really the only option she probably thought that she had. Why? Because it wasn't hers. It belonged to God. And so she was going to do what would honor God. And when you understand that it all belongs to God, then it's easier for you to live a life that's more like a road instead of a roadblock. Here's what I mean. A road is a path. It's a clear path for cars or for, or for people to move back and forth to get to where they're going. A roadblock stops that flow. It stops that flow. When we live as God intended us to live, then as a generous people, then we allow his blessings to flow through us. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing. The word mine, that attitude, mine, that, that can develop in our hearts, that's a roadblock. But humility says it's not mine, and what I want to do is I want, it, I want to pass this on. I have been blessed so that, God, so that God can bless others. It's not just for me. It's not mine. It belongs to him, and that takes humility. In a generous life, it starts with humility. Second thing, a generous life, it's characterized by faith. It's characterized by faith. Jesus said the widow gave all that she had. All that she had. He points out that the other gifts, the large gifts that were given by the rich, they were coming from their surplus. They had plenty more. Now, now, please don't hear me saying that what the rich were giving, that was bad. Or what they were doing was wrong. I don't think there's judgment necessarily here on Jesus' part at this point. We don't know much about what they were giving or, or how much they were giving. But what Jesus points out here is that there's more with the rich people. There was more where that came from. But in the widow's case, in the widow's case, that's all there is. He said theirs came from their riches and hers came from her poverty. And when you give all, this is a question I want you to answer. When you give all that you have, what do you have left? What? Nothing. Yeah. When you give all that you have, you have nothing. So some people would say that's foolish. That's just dumb. But I think Jesus would say, that's faith. This widow was living in faith. She probably didn't know where her next meal would come from. She probably really didn't have any idea where she would get the basic necessities of life. There was no savings for her. There was no nest egg to fall back on. There was no husband to provide for her. There was no family. It was just her. And she gave all that she had. Now, the idea is not that we should all go home and give everything away. But I think the key question here is, when was the last time your faith cost you something? When was the last time your faith cost you something? It's easy to, it's easy to live in your comfort zone. That's the very definition of the word, doing something because it feels good. This is, this is going to be okay. This is going to be easy. This will be comfortable. That's where everyone wants to be. That's where I want to be. I'll just be flat out honest with you. I want to be in my comfort zone. I love it there. It's kind of, it's my default. It's safe. And here's, here's the key part of, of the comfort zone is we, me, I'm in control. In my comfort zone, I'm in control. 
And what this widow does is what God is calling all of us to do as individuals and as a church. We must take steps of faith. When we step out on faith, that's when we get to see God show up and do things that only he can do. Did you catch that? When we step out on faith, that's when, God, that's when we get to see God do things that only he can do. There's no faith in staying in the comfort zone. There's no faith in staying in the boat. The, the, the faith comes when we step out of the boat and begin to walk on water, as Jesus said that we could do. There's no faith in keeping what you have. The faith comes is when you turn it over towards God. And here, let me tell you something, too, in case you don't know this. You've probably heard me or somebody say this over and over again. God is under no obligation to bless disobedience. If we're not willing to take a step of faith with him, he's under no obligation to bless us. Now, here's a good diagnostic question for you. If you weren't a follower of Jesus, how would your life be different? If you weren't a follower of Jesus, how would you spend your time? How would, you, uh, how would your talents, your gifts, how would you use those differently? Your treasure, your money, what would you invest in? If you weren't a believer, a follower of Jesus, how would your life be different? Now, that... That's not a question that, that I want to shame you with or to make you feel bad. This is simply a question of how has your faith in God, how has your faith changed your life? Where are you living out your faith? Where are you stepping out of what's easy or out of what you can control and putting your faith in God? And now here's the difference, okay? Some people say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm stepping out in faith because, you know, I, this is what I'm doing because I, I, I know I'm, I can do it. I'm good at this. I can do this. I'm comfortable here. This is, this, is, this is easy for me. I like to do this. So God, I want to serve you here. That's not faith. That's good. I'm not saying don't do that. But where are you stepping out on faith? Where are you stepping out where you say, God, I have no idea what's going to happen here. I've got to trust you. Because I, feel, I don't feel comfortable in this situation. This isn't me. This, isn't what, I, this is not normal for me, God. I want to step out in this. In, with, I want to give you my time, even though it, it, it's not comfortable. My treasure. God, I want to give you my talents. Where are we stepping out in faith? How are you stepping out in faith with your time? How are you stepping out in faith with your talents? How are you stepping out in faith with your treasure? How are you stepping out of your faith? How are you stepping out in faith? out of your comfort zone so that God can do a work in you and through you. A generous life is made possible by faith. The world, our world, our culture has a million ideas on how you should invest your time, talents, and treasure. But faith says, I trust you, God, whatever you ask. Whatever you ask. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, please don't read that and hear me say that my life will be easy my life will be problem-free. I'll be rich. Those are wants, okay? That's the craziness that you see when you turn on TV and you go towards some of those religious channels and you hear preachers saying, you know, hey, give, send in your seed money, you know, or whatever, and you do that, and God's going to bless you with, with all the money you ever wanted, or he's going to give you that house, or he's going to give you that business, or you'll never have the flu again, or whatever, whatever craziness that you're hearing out there. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul didn't say that my God will supply all your wants. He said that he will supply all your needs. So when we step out of our comfort zone and we're generous with our time, which a lot of us say, man, I don't have any extra time, Jimmy. When we step out of our comfort zone and are gener generous with our talents or abilities that a lot of us think seem so insignificant to us or we question how they'll be used, or when we step out of our comfort zone and are generous with our treasure... Again, we don't think we have enough money. God's promise is to take care of us, to show up in those moments of faith. When you give your time, God will use it to change eternity. When you give your talents, God will use them to further his kingdom. When you give of your treasure, God will multiply that so that others can hear the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing is ever wasted with God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 says this, The point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person, person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves 
a cheerful giver. The only way to grow in faith is to take steps of faith. The only way that you see God move in your life is if you move towards God. You don't get to see God move if you stay in your comfort zone. You can hold on to your time, to your talents, to your treasures, but you won't get to experience God at work in you and through you. The only way you see God at work is to join him where he is already at work. A generous life is characterized by faith. The third one there, a generous life is characterized by action. By action. You must do something. The widow went to the temple and she gave, she gave her offering. She gave all that she had. She was willing to do it. Now, a lot of us, we're, we're, we're cool with Jesus. We're cool with God. You know what, God, you love me, I love you. Let, let's, let's, be, let's stay there. Let's, let's be okay there. But the minute that God asks us to do something, that's when we're not cool anymore. And that's where we try to kind of wiggle our way out and we try to do something a little bit different maybe than what God wants us to do. Uh, Watch this video real quick. And now, deep thoughts from a superficial Christian. God wants us to be a generous people. In fact, in Luke 6.30, It says, give to anyone who asks. I think it's important that we do what the Bible says. Fortunately, it doesn't say what we should give. So, if someone asks me for money to buy gas, I give them some bubble gum. Gum tastes better, and you can't blow bubbles with gas. Or, if a friend of mine asks me to help them move, I give them some advice. I tell them, You shouldn't have so much stuff. There are people in Africa who don't have a pull-out couch. Sell all your possessions, and then I'll be glad to come help you move. That's what Jesus would do. This has been Deep Thoughts from a Superficial Christian. We laugh at that, but we try to wiggle our way out of some things like that, right? We try. God tells us to do something, and we're like, well, okay. I'll do that-ish, kind of, kind of what you're talking about, God. But let, let, let me do it a little bit differently. And we're all okay with God, but God requires action. 1 John three seventeen says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? You see, action is a direct result of faith. God's love says that we're going to be moved towards action. A generous life is characterized by movement. It's it's doing something, but not just what we want, like that video. It's not just doing what we want. It's doing what God has called us to do. It's, It's like if someone comes to your door. Let's say someone came to your door this afternoon, and um, they they had all the appearances of, of homelessness. Okay, they, they, they just didn't have anything. And they come to your door, and they say, I have no food. I'm hungry. And then you say, oh, my brother, I'm so devastated by your plight. I'm so sorry that you have nothing. I understand your pain. I feel your pain. It reminds me to be thankful for what I have. I'm blessed to have a refrigerator and a pantry full of food because I know that it can all be taken away from me. God is good, brother. I will pray for you. Please know, know that God loves you. He cares for you. He knows your every need and he'll meet that need. I pray that you will be blessed with food for your empty belly. I know he can do it. He has given so much. Let my life be an example to you, O hungry brother. You too will be blessed with food. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye. Close the door. So other than uh, an, an annoying, an annoying uh, impersonation of a, of a preacher, what, what, what did you give that person? Nothing. You gave him absolutely nothing. And in fact, according to the verse we just read, 1 John three seventeen, we would have to question if the love of God is really in your heart. But I don't have much to give, Jimmy. I don't have a lot to offer. I don't have any special talents. I don't have any special abilities. I'm just fill in the blank. What do I have to offer? So my question back is, so what, well, what are you going to do? 
Are you going to offer God excuses? Or are you going to offer God your two coins? Trust me, what you have, what you can do, what you can give, God, God will put it to use for his kingdom and, and for his glory. God, here's the deal. God already knows what you have because he gave it to you. So it's okay to trust him. He knows, God knows what he's working with. Hebrews 13, 16 says, don't neglect to do good, to do what is good and to share for God is pleased with such sacrifices. You see, the get out of jail free card for a lot of us is, well, someone else will take care of that. I'm sure someone else will, will, will meet that need or, or, or be involved in that ministry or, or take care of that responsibility. Or, or that's not my calling. That's, that's not how I'm gifted. You know what those are? A lot of times those are just excuses for not wanting to get out of our comfort zones. Because we don't, we don't want to leave what we know. We don't want to leave what's familiar. We don't, we don't want to leave that maybe something that, that doesn't fit with what we think it should be. But you see, when God says that he wants us to be generous, then we, we've been called to, to action. And the, question, the answer to his question of whatever he's calling us to do should always, always be yes. God has called us to be generous. He's called us, he's called all of us to share our time, our talents, our treasures. He's called all of us to action. If you follow Jesus' life, then what you'll see in Scripture is that he was a man of action. He was, he was active. He's not just telling people what to do or, or how to live their life, but he's modeling what he's calling us to do. Faith, it leads to action, and a generous life is not one of passivity, but it's one of activity, activity that uses our time, talents, and treasures for those things of God. And the last thing there, a generous life is, is characterized by sacrifice. One of the definitions I found of sacrifice is this. It says, the surrender or destruction of something prized or desirable for the sake of something considered as having a higher or more pressing claim. Let me say it again. The surrender or destruction of something prized or desirable. Okay, Prized and desirable, my time, my talents, my treasure, my comfort. Those are things that are prized and desirable. But listen to this. The surrender or destruction of those things for the sake of something considered as having a higher or more pressing claim. What is higher or what is the more pressing claim when it comes to my talents, my treasure, my time? It's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God. There's nothing more valuable, nothing more greater, no greater investment of my time, talents, and treasures. There's no, there's no greater reason to get out of my comfort zone than to make the name of Jesus Christ famous all over this world. I surrender my life so that others can know you, God. It's not my time. It's not my talents. It's not my treasures. I want them. Believe me, I want them. I want to claim them, but I surrender any hold or any claim to those things so that they can be used to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and to further your name in this world. Why? Because it is the highest and most pressing claim. It would be foolish of me to hold on to those things. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Why would we hold back when we understand the sacrifice that God has made for us? Matter of fact, I think that's why we hold back. Because we don't understand the weight of the cross. We don't understand the, the sacrifice, the, 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 the sacrifice that was made by God. How can we look to the cross and still say, mine? How can we look to, to the cross of Jesus and still say, my time, my talent, my treasure, my comfort? Generosity is the loving and appropriate response to a loving, sacrificial, and generous God. Luke 9, 23 says, Jesus continued to say to all of them, any of you who want to be my follower must stop thinking about yourself and what you want. You must be willing to carry the cross that is given to you every day for following me. Did you hear that? Stop thinking about yourself and what you want. You know why Jesus said that? 
Because it's the, uh, it's the exact opposite of generosity and it's the exact opposite of loving. It's the opposite of who Jesus wants us to be. It's actually the opposite of who Jesus is. Philippians tells us that he left heaven, not thinking of himself, but he left heaven to come into this world, to live a sinless life, to die a death that wasn't his death, to pay for sin that weren't his sins, so that we could have life. That's not who, that's who Jesus is. Thinking about yourself and just what you want is the opposite of who he is. But it's, get this, it's the exact, it's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. He wants that to be your mission statement, that word mine. He'd love for that to be on all of our hearts, and all of our minds. He wants it to be your life's goal. He wants you to think about you, only you, and only what you want. But you see, God calls us not to be imitators of this world. He calls us not to be imitators of culture. He calls us not to be imitators of what we see around us. He calls us to be imitators of him. A God who is willing to sacrifice so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we love. And that's what God is calling us to do as well. To sacrifice. The generous life, here's the deal. This generous life is not meant to burden you. It's not meant to burden you. It's meant to free you. And actually, it's meant to change you. It's meant to take your focus off of yourself and put it squarely on God. God, the source of our time, the source of our talents, the source of our treasures. May we be known as a generous people. And if we are a generous people, guess what? then we will be known as a generous church. And when people see our generosity, you know, what they're, you know what happens? They're drawn to that. They're drawn. They're drawn to our humility. They're drawn to our sacrifice. They're drawn to our action. They're drawn to those type of things. And they see that and they want it. And what that gives us is that gives us an opportunity to share the gospel to tell other people about Jesus. And it all starts with a life that is characterized by generosity.